Well, I'm excited uh, as we come into this Christmas season. We are right in the thick of it. Um, and uh, excited as we continue to study here in the book of Luke, um, leading up to the Christmas story in chapter 2. Got one more passage today. And then there's a, a section between here and chapter 2 that will kind of be the theme of our candlelight service Thursday night. Um, a theme called the big picture, which is, I think, comes from the prophecy of Zechariah, comes to the end of chapter 1. Today we're right in the, the, the thick of chapter 1 at verse 57, and if you have your Bibles or you use an app, let's go ahead and turn there, and we're going to read, uh, read this passage of Scripture uh, titled, His Name is John. Verse 57, it says, When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. Just a quick refresher, Zechariah here was a, a priest, and, and earlier in this chapter we find out he, he had gotten the opportunity to go into the holiest of holies um, as, in his role as priest, and an angel showed up and said, hey, Zechariah, your prayer has been answered. You and Elizabeth are going to have a son. You're going to have a child, and his name is going to be John, and, and Zechariah didn't believe him because they were beyond the childbearing age. And he says, well, the angel said, well, since you don't believe me, you're not going to talk until the child is born. And so here we have Zacharias gone home, and in the, the, the full term of the pregnancy, he's been mute. And some wives said, man, that would have been amazing. <laughs> and so he's not spoken the entire pregnancy. And I don't know how she made it and knew what to do without him being able to talk. Um, and so he hadn't spoken the entire time, and it, it comes time, the, the child is born, and all the friends and relatives are so excited, and, and just the whole stirring of this, of Elizabeth, who's been without child and, and had that reputation, and it was really frowned upon, now is being blessed by the Lord with a child. So people were there celebrating with her, and they're like, you should name this child Zachariah. You should name it after his dad. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. Verse 61, they were like, what? That doesn't make any sense. There's no one in all your family by that name. So they gestured to ask the baby's father, ask Zachariah, what do you want to name him? What do you want to name him, Zachariah? And he couldn't talk. Maybe he couldn't hear either because they gestured, right? They were like, Zachariah, what do you want to name him, the baby? What do you name him? And he motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote... His name is John. He didn't write, I think we should name him John. You see, because God had spoken something. He had said something through his messenger to Zechariah. He told him that you're going to have a son and his name is going to be John. And so when they finally get Zechariah and they get his attention, they're like, I know he will want to name the child after himself. And maybe he had written a note at some point to, to Elizabeth and said, we want to name him John. But for some reason, this blew their mind that, that Elizabeth says, we're going to name him John. And then Zechariah says, his name is John. And it says, instantly Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. It says this all, this happening is an awe fell upon the whole neighborhood. And the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, what will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. I hope you all remember this is John the Baptist that's being born, um, that will prepare the way for Jesus that goes before him and begins to call on people to repentance and, and saying there's going to be one that comes after me that gets to baptize Jesus. This is the baby that has just been born. And there, there was something about this child that around the neighborhood, like Elizabeth shouldn't be having babies. His name shouldn't be John. They both agreed on it. Something's up. All right. That's what the, that's what happening right here. But what I love is this line. I just love this line. His name is John. And so I've preached on this passage before, and I thought God was going to take me the same way all week. I thought uh, that's where God wants me to go. And yesterday, God just started stirring in my heart, and this is not a sermon I've preached before. It's happened over the last 
18 hours, so you just hang on, because I'm hanging on, um, and it's, a, it's different than what I thought it was going to be. But this is, this is the principle. Remember, Luke is writing to Theophilus in Rome, and he started out by saying, so you can be certain of some things. So we always got to remember the audience here. And, and so Luke is still writing to Theophilus in Rome. And in this part, he's telling the story of John. And, and John says his name is John. And, and, or Zachariah says his name is John. I think Luke really wants Theophilus to see. Listen, Theo. All right. When God says it is, it is. It doesn't happen with all of us. It doesn't. We, our word is maybe not that solid. We aspire to it be. Lots of people told me you're only good as good as your word, right? We have a we had a contractor doing some work when we moved earlier this spring. We paid him a deposit. Guess when we saw him again? Never. <laughs> all right, all right, and, and he's, I'll be there next week. Next week we come. No show. Next week, I'll be there in two weeks. I promise we'll get caught up and we'll be there. No show. Guess what? I believe next time he said when he was going to be there, I wasn't even home. Right? Like, you, you realize people, some people just don't keep their word. And yet God has this general principle in and of himself that if he says it, it is and it will come to pass. Now, we could take that principle and go anywhere in the Bible. There's lots of stuff here, and, and really what God started to stir in me was this idea, really the, the totality of the gospel. That's what you're going to get this morning. It's Christmas season, and, and so I want us to just wrap our, around, our heads around three things that, that the Bible teaches us that is, and if God says it, it just is, and we can be confident, and we can, we can rest in it, all right? Are you ready? The first one's not so much fun. They get better, I promise. The, the first one is this truth, this reality that the Bible teaches us that without Christ, we are dead. It's a pretty sobering message. Um, it's an attack that the culture will come upon. Uh, it's a very basic truth of Christianity is that without Christ, we are dead. Let me just share uh, some scripture. Galatians 3.10, Paul wrote to that church and he says, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So I want you to understand just the, the story of the earth as it relates to God, of the, the God of the Bible, is that God created the earth. He created it to be perfect, and, and he wanted men, and Adam and Eve, and mankind to rule with him in this earth. He gave them work before the fall. They were to tend the garden. They were to be a part of his kingdom. And mankind rebelled against that, really chose to be their own king. All right, And so here Paul tells us in Galatians, we are all born into this curse. If you think of it as a, a story, and maybe it's like Lord of the Rings or one of these fictitious stories, all of humanity fell under this curse, of which the, the penalty was, one, work got a lot harder and life got troubled and we got sick. Physical death happened. It says the wages of sin are death. But also that we would be eternally separated from God. We could not be with him. So Paul's telling the Galatians, you know, through the story of the Old Testament, we know God reveals his spoken word, his Bible, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie, shall not steal, all those, all those great things. And then they expand it and there's more rules and laws. All these things are given. And the Jews in the time that Jesus comes, their way to get to God was to live by the law. To make him happy to live as righteous and as best they could. And see, we're all born into this curse. Some of it, it's what's inherited. But I'll promise you this, we do our part to earn it, <laughs> right? I mean, we've all made mistakes, missteps. We've been selfish. We've hoarded our money. We've, we've, we've lied. We've cheated at some point. We, we, uh, we disobeyed our parents. I mean, you name it. Somewhere down the line, like we broke over and we just couldn't live up 
to the perfection. And we're born into that curse, and us as parents, guess what? Your kids are too. Just born into this curse. Like when you look at them and they're struggling to be perfect, just remember they're under a curse. They're born into it. And so we rebelled against God. We inherited this condition. We lived into it. Uh, Ephesians 2.1, I mean, Paul wrote it just as plain as this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, to which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Another reminder in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Can we boast then that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we're made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. All right, that's a lot of words. We're going, to, we're going to tackle some scripture this morning. I want you to hear through everything I just said that this is a condition of mankind, God's expectation. He gave us the law, live up to it. We couldn't do it. Out of that came this curse, and the wages of sin are death. Without Christ, we are dead. We have no hope. You're like, man, this Christmas sermon is just amazing. I'm so inspired right now. <laughs> you just took us right there, Jared. You got, but, but until you understand this truth, Christmas doesn't mean anything. Until you realize the state of humanity at that time who had been longing and waiting for the prom- prophesied Messiah. And we have never lived in a time where there was no hope. Where we didn't know the story of Jesus. Where we didn't know the story of grace and mercy. But until we understand this reality, and until, we, until we don't accept the lies that we'll tell ourselves sometimes that, you know, uh, well, I know they say you need Jesus, but, you know, I've gone to church, I give pretty faithfully, and, you know, I volunteer at the homeless shelter, and I do good things. We'll, we'll think those things are enough to make us alive. Or even if we put our faith in Christ, we'll begin to think those things are what proves it or what really gets me over the top and makes God really love me. But here's what the Bible teaches is without Christ, we're dead. Without hope in our transgressions. Now, let's move on to some jolly Christmas news. With Christ, we are alive. We are alive. Now, I want you to just to, to ride with me through this for a minute. Begin to ask this question. Man, I've just had so many good conversations over the last couple of weeks with many of you and people in our community. And they begin to wrestle with things they've learned growing up and, and maybe some, some religious experiences they had that, that taught them some things that they're really confused about. And they'll say, when, when do you get saved? How do you get saved? How do I know I'm saved? Like I spent some time and I, I got baptized at one point and then, then I felt scared every week and I wondered, am I still saved? And you would come back next Sunday and you think, did I mess up too much this week? And, 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 or you, or we, we get baptized and then people say, man, it's like you celebrate the baptism and someone giving their life to Christ. And it's like everybody says, I hope they can make it. 
I hope they can make it. We rest all upon Jesus for the baptism, and then it becomes on us to do the rest. To make sure we get there. This is a truth that with Christ, in Christ, you are alive. You are saved. What am I talking about? Mark 1, 14. After John the Baptist was put in prison, I know it's Christmas coming up and Jesus ain't supposed to be born yet, but we're going to talk about some things he said. All right? Mark 1, 14, John the Baptist gets put in prison and it says that Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, the gospel. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. To be in that time would be to have heard those things and good news, the Greek word euangelion, would have, would have meant to them it was tied to always a kingship. It would have meant there was a new king of Rome. It would have meant something has happened. I got an announcement, a proclamation to make. There's a new king. So here's Jesus saying this. And then he says something that, that's prophesied over and over in the Old Testament about a new king that's going to come and set up a new king of Israel. And his, his kingdom would rule forever and ever and go on. And he's looking at these people. And, and Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come near. He's not saying it's gonna, you're going to get there soon. You better get ready. He's not saying that. He's saying, you're looking at it. <laughs> That's pretty powerful worlds. It, like, it is in proximity to you. Not only that, anybody who wants to believes in me can be a part of the kingdom of God. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit after I leave. And uh, Listen, you are not just going to get to go to heaven. I brought some heaven right here into this place. And all this brokenness and hopelessness that you feel and the, the, the lack of peace, these things I'm about to fix. I'm going to begin reconciling the world unto myself. And repent here. I grew up thinking of it, repent. I need to repent of my sins. I thought that meant I need to feel really bad for the lie I told this week or the thing I did this week. And I got to keep asking forgiveness. And I got to say, I'm sorry. And, and, and repent for me. Began to feel like I'm going to turn from sinning to not sinning. When Jesus said this, when he says it here in Mark chapter 1, when he says, repent and believe the good news, I, I want you to know the life they were living under was already that life of that I got to follow the rules to get saved. He says, I want you to change your mind about that. I want you to turn from that. I want you to believe the good news. One Bible dictionary says repentance is like this. It's in its fullest sense of its term for a complete change of orientation. Involving a judgment upon the past and a deliberate redirection for the future. What we see here is that repentance is more than remorse. Okay? Are you with me? It's more than remorse and just a desire to escape the consequences of sin. The gospel proclamation that will say, listen, we're sinners and this is part of it, okay? We're sinners, and, and, but Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and he died and he paid the punishment for us and he was resurrected. And, and if we believe in him, we could have eternal life. So we, we just position this, this thing to say, well, do you want to go to hell or heaven? And so you're choosing Jesus. So this, this remorse for our sins and just I want to change the consequences is it, a bigger message that Jesus is saying here. When you say yes to that, it's one thing. But when you hear the message of Jesus says, there's a new king in town. And has led you into separation from me. I invite you into my kingdom and I want you to make me king of your life. Because what was happening was, I think Jesus and daddy were up in heaven. Father, God the Father. 
They were looking down on humanity who had surrendered. And I, I, I used to think, man, my sin makes God mad. And I've been reading this book, Gentle and Lowly. It's an amazing book. And we find that sin breaks God's heart. That, that he's looking down and he sees a hopeless humanity that is under a curse that they can never get out of. It's like we've gotten a cancer. Imagine your child has cancer. And he's not wanting you to just get your act together. I mean, he wishes you could, but he knows you can't. And he realizes it's up to him. He's into our world and our life and live it perfectly. <coughs> and he comes and he does that and he, he takes the punishment of the sin that we all deserved and the curse we can never break, which is death. He breaks it. <laughs> resurrected God himself in believing that resurrection we get put into him we get to live in his righteousness and his goodness we become justified in God's eyes what really happens when we repent is a radical reorientation of our entire life radically different we become radically different People. It means we're not just turning from, from sin to not sinning. It doesn't mean we're turning from drunkenness to sobriety. It doesn't mean we're turning from, you know, pornography addiction to, to clean search histories. It doesn't mean we're, we're turning from greed to giving. It doesn't mean we're, we're turning from jealousy to gratitude. It means we are turning from our sinful condition to Jesus. The temptation here is to not believe this. To not believe that with Christ we are alive. We begin to feel like the church in Galatia that Paul wrote to. And he says, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? He said, did you? By following all the rules, is that how you got the Holy Spirit? He said, can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? So Christ has truly set us free in chapter 5 of Galatians. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision, this was their major rule. This was the thing that if you did, it was please God. And so the church in Galatia, they accepted Jesus, got saved, and then someone started telling them, well, you've got to follow all the rules of the Jews, too. You need to get circumcised. You can only eat this kind of food. You need to come here on this day. You can't carry that on this day. And started adding all these things to it. So it became Jesus plus Man, we will get there. So tempting to get there. Paul would tell us now, if you are counting on your church attendance, if you're counting on the way you dress, if you're counting on your giving, if you're counting on, on your selflessness and on, on, on your, your volunteer hours to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. In other words, if Jesus can save us and then we have the pressure to carry ourselves to the end and we could choose to do right and to the end and keep ourselves saved, then you don't need Jesus in the first place. Then what use it? If you can do it, do it. That's what Paul is saying. Go for it. But we know the truth of Rome that we are all sinners and come short of the glory. So we cannot do it. Without Christ, we are dead, and only with him are we alive and saved. Now, does that mean we just get saved? And Paul addresses this, and we get saved, and we just live this. Well, we gave Jesus our life, and now we just keep living in sin, and we're going to sin more, so grace can abound more. And Paul's like, this doesn't even make sense. Because you, when you repent, the power of the Holy Spirit comes up inside of you. You have a radical reorientation of life. And so even though you turn from, from, uh, from, from drunkenness to Jesus, because of the fruit of the Spirit and the work of God inside of you, you won't even realize it, and you'll start having a different attitude toward drunkenness. 
All of a sudden, your money won't be everything. And you just be like, God, what is money even? I don't even care. You can have it. Give it to them. And you'll be like, that wasn't me. Where is this coming from? Like, what is happening to me? It's called in the renewing of your mind. It's called real salvation. It's called understanding the depths of God's good news. That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. In chapter 5, verse 22 of Galatians, he says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Romans 8, 1 says, If we are in Christ Jesus... There is no condemnation. In Christ Jesus, no condemnation. With Christ, we are alive. Enemy will get you thinking, but I messed up this week. But I this, thou that. But I can't do it. He'll get you to think if you've never and given your life to Christ and you thought, man, it's just, uh, that's a commitment to do good. It's not a commitment to do good. It's not a commitment to just turn it over a new leaf. It's an understanding of the grace of God in your life that he loves you so deeply even though you, could, you have no right to come to him. And when you understand the gratitude that stems up in your heart from knowing that he loves you like that, he will change you. You will change. The fruit of the Spirit will come. This is a commitment to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. That's the commitment. We know those two things. Without Christ, we're dead. With Christ, we are alive. And being alive in Christ means we have purpose. Absolutely. We have purpose. This decision to repent means we get to join God in his work on earth to bring some heaven and be good here, to be some good news, to be a part of what he wants to do in a community, to reveal himself to our neighbors and our families. Like he begins, he's like, all right, you're in. You're in the kingdom. You're a family of God. Now, listen, Ephesians 2.10, he says, I created you anew. In Jesus Christ, and I got good things for you to do. Let's go. Stop worrying about if you're saved, is what I'm saying. That's what Jesus is saying. Stop worrying. Like, you need to get out of here. This escapist mentality of that the gospel is just about where we go when we die. When Jesus' big announcement was the gospel, the good news is that God is here and he's present and he's in Pikeville. He's through his church. The kingdom of God is in Pikeville. When John the Baptist begins to doubt and he's in prison and he sends two of his disciples to Jesus and he says, Jesus, tell me, are you for sure you're the Messiah? And right while they come to see him, he's like healing people. He's, he's casting demons out. Blind people are seeing. And he looks at them. He's like, just go tell them what you see. Here's the evidence. The kingdom of God is here. I, he said, I am the Messiah. This is the heartbeat of the church. It's a heartbeat of you that, that we are like these little drops of light dropped into darkness. And I ask myself, where's the evidence the kingdom of God is in Pikeville? Where would even a, a non-believer say, the church, man, I'm so... Like even the blind man who got his sight, his family who never may have accepted Jesus as Savior, they'd say, that guy's good news. That guy is good news. John 10.10 10 said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, this is Jesus speaking, that they may have life and have it abundantly. I see evidence all around us of the kingdom of God. I saw it last week, last Sunday afternoon when we had Christmas on the bypass I believe people left that place saying, that's some good news. I believe they called their friends and said, hey, that old part store building that was falling down, can God work through a rundown part store and begin to reveal himself to a community who thinks there's no hope? 
Absolutely, he can. I've got a boxing gym where we, I've had family say, this has changed my son's life. We tell everybody. He was struggling with all these different things and discipline, and, and now we've seen, thank you all. This is good news. I think about, we have Thai food in a coffee shop. I don't know if y'all saw this over the last couple of weeks. This wrecks my mind. We've been praying about doing lunch there and food. And we've, this, the coffee shop, we've been there three years at Faith Life Market. And if, if you're new here, a church through a partner ministry we launched called Faith Life Ministries. We operate a coffee shop, boxing gym. We're weird, I know. <laughs> this couple shows up six weeks ago from Thailand, literally knocks on the door out here. She's here, traveling nurse. The husband comes with her, and he says, hey, uh, they asked the community college down here. He's taking English as a second language, and he says, I, I'd like to cook. I'd like to start a Thai restaurant. The community college referred him to New Beginnings. They walk up the, up the street from over here, the campus. They knock on the door, and they say, hey, we'd like to start a Thai restaurant. David answered the door. David, I didn't get to talk to him the first day. He's like, hey, we've been praying about food, and this couple came by, and they want to start a Thai restaurant out of the coffee shop. I'm like, that wasn't what I was praying for, I don't think. <laughs> and then I went, maybe it is. They don't know anybody else here. We've got to build a relationship with Tom and Whip. See them there on the left of the screen. They don't, they don't. First long conversation we had with them, we, uh, we, we hired them to, to cook us a meal on a Sunday afternoon just to experience the food. I love Thai food, don't eat it very often, but I thought, well, let's see what this is. It was amazing, a huge spread of food. Um, they gave us a price, felt God in my spirit say, pay them double. Can barely communicate with them, right? And I'm like, how do I tell them the gospel? How do I demonstrate this to them? God said, pay them double. We paid them double. The first long conversation we had with them at the end of it, I said, so do y'all go to church? Are you Christian? They said, no, we're Buddhist. We begin working and planning, and just slowly we accidentally start this Thai restaurant. We've been down there. We were, we were playing with them, and she begins to ask questions. Are y'all Protestant or Catholic? Come to find out she had a friend who was Christian growing up. He used to go to Christmas parties. Also come to find out she called across the world and invited her sister to move here. And when she shared that good news, guess who was in behind it all? A man named Jesus. A church has this coffee shop, and they're letting us cook in their kitchen. Now her sister's thinking about moving from Thailand to Pikeville. <laughs> and this happened, and, and, and the second or third day we're serving food down. It was all on, hands on deck the first two or three days. Like second or third day, this med school student comes up, and she's picking up her food in the back. And she says, I cannot believe this. I feel like God has shined down on me. She's not from the... She's not... From, uh, from Kentucky. Her prayer had been that there would be more diverse food options in Pikeville. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, God, can you move heaven and earth to reveal yourself to one med student? That they could say, Jesus gets involved in my life like this? That's the good news of the kingdom. That's the good news of Jesus in a manger. I want to tell one more story as I close as the worship team comes up. 
Harker, our little boy, he's five years old. This week we were standing, I'm standing in the backyard. One of those beautiful days. I mean, this weather's crazy, right? Like one day it feels like spring. I think I need to start mowing grass. One day I'm freezing. Well, I was out in the backyard and I was looking at the back door. We had a storm door and Harker and our dog, you've heard my stories about the dog that gets loose and we chase all over Scott Avenue. <clears throat> Well, they were both looking out the door, and they were kind of down the floor, and I, I looked away for a second, and then I looked back, and our dog is running through the backyard, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I didn't see Harker let him out, but I had a hunch. Because <laughs> Harker was still inside, and he was just looking through the glass. And so he gets up, and he comes out, and he says, the dog got out. And I'm like, I see that. And uh, I said, did you let him out? And, you know, as a parent, you know the face of a liar. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he says, uh, no. I'm like, well, how did he get out? Because you were still in there. Like, it wasn't like he got out while you were trying to get out. And he was like, I didn't let him out. And I was like, all right. Here, here's, what, here's what hit me. A lot of stuff I've heard and felt in my life is I wanted to say, listen, buddy. Lying makes God angry. I wanted to say liars go to hell. Can I be frank with you for a minute? <laughs> I, for one, am thankful that liars don't have to go to hell. I wanted to say that to him. I thought, no, wait. So I sat down with him, and he's going to grow up like I can. my dad is a pastor. I sat down with him, and I was like, hey, buddy, listen, God teaches us lying. Is, you know, it's not just stop lying so you can go to heaven, okay? I sat down with him. I said, he teaches us lying is not the way to do relationships. Because when you lie to me, I don't trust you the next time. People don't trust you. And I explained to him the importance of telling the truth and lying. And so I was like, I would rather you tell me the truth. And he just went like this. I said, did you let the dog out? And he just went, yeah. <laughs> and I, I wrapped my arms around him. I told him I loved him. He's under a curse. You tell me you never lied to your mom and dad when you were five? It's brought me and my wife, Bethany, into this place of even going into the Christmas season as we close here. And I think about the message of Santa. Like, it's been wrecking us lately. I'm like, wait, this is in direct contradiction to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody in this room, what list y'all on? Are you with me for a minute? We're on the naughty list. And so we, 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 hinge, we, we hinge our kids' behavior, and we try to just surface level change it by offering a, a gift in return. And God says, I don't want your superficial change of behavior. I don't want you to just try to be better so you don't go to hell and you make me happy. You can't do it. I want you to surrender and fall into my arms and let me do it. That's the message of the gospel. So I ask you as we close and we sing one more song, have you experienced a radical reorientation of your life? Have you been wrecked by the gospel message, the gratitude of grace in your life? Some of you may have experienced that and you've never taken the next step and gotten the water and just gone into baptism and said, God, I'm telling the world, you have changed my life. I would encourage you to take that step. Some of you have never maybe thought about the gospel presented in this way that he has come down and he loves you and so much and he died for you in a way that's not just about eternity. Yes, absolutely, it determines heaven or hell, what we do with Jesus. But it also changes you right now. He loves us 
that much. Without Christ, we are dead. With him, we are alive. And when we're alive in him, we have purpose. When God says it is, it is his name is John. You are a child of God by his merit and not yours. And that's something to celebrate at Christmas as we stand up and we sing this song that we all wrote together. When, when the baby came down, it gave hope to the whole world. He said, change your mind about doing this yourself. I'm going to do it for you. I love you. You have been wrecked with this. It's destroyed in your life, let me bring some hope into it. Today I want you to know you can come pray. The altar is open wherever God is dealing with you, however it does, but I'd love to pray with you, hug your neck, tell you I love you. I invite you into his kingdom on his behalf. He's made the invitation, whosoever who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit, for the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives to renew our minds and change our hearts, to turn us to a completely new direction in life and to use us for your good. God, we invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.